In the spirit of the Jesuit tradition of composition of place, we acknowledge that Gonzaga University resides on the tribal ancestral homelands of the Spokane peoples. It is this land that holds the cultural DNA, the energy and spirits of the first peoples, the peoples of the river. It is their ancestors from which the knowledge and power resides and comes to us in this moment. We're grateful to be on this land and ask for its support as we gather to move in our intentions through minds, bodies, and spirits for the greater good. Hello, my name is Father Scott Santa Rosa. I am the Provincial of Jesuits West, and it gives me great joy, and it is an honor to offer this blessing of the Gonzaga Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for your many blessings, especially the abundance of your creation, the way you labor in our earth and in our flowers and plants, in the air we breathe and in people. We thank you for all that you give us through creation. We acknowledge this day our failures and our need to do more to recognize our profound connection to all of life, to hear the cry of the poor and the earth, and to take action towards transforming injustice to healing and reconciliation. We give you thanks for Father Arturo Sosa, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, and how he boldly lays out as one of our four apostolic preferences, care for our common home, and for Pope Francis, who helped promulgate that preference. And we give you thanks for this center. We ask that this center would be blessed, that it would be fruitful in its mission, that it would use interdisciplinary research and scholarship and teaching to help educate young people in the care of our common home. And so, loving God, grateful for the many blessings you give us, we humbly ask you today to bless this center, the Gonzaga Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And God bless you all, and us all. Amen. Welcome. I'm Thane McCullough, President of Gonzaga University, and it is my honor and privilege to welcome you here today as we officially launch Gonzaga's new Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment. We are delighted you can join us for this historic moment. It was 51 years ago today that we first celebrated Earth Day. Millions of people took to the streets to call for more action to address the scourge of air and water pollution afflicting communities coast to coast and around the world. Much progress has been made in the intervening decades, thanks to laws like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. In many places, the air and water is cleaner. Yet, despite that progress, we know much more remains to be done. We are living through a pivotal moment, a hinge moment, within human history and the history of life on this planet. Amidst the public health crisis of the global pandemic, the ecological crisis continues to grow. The climate crisis is magnified in the context of systemic social disparities and the global pandemic as it disproportionately impacts the poor and contributes to significant health problems for people everywhere. Our attention to the issue of global climate change is nourished by our faith and the leadership of the Roman Catholic Church which calls us all, individuals and institutions alike, to act urgently, not only to reduce our impact by changing our habits, but also to change our hearts, to care for our common home. As the Holy Father Pope Francis has noted in the context of the ecological crisis, a great 
cultural, spiritual, and educational challenge stands before us, and it will demand that we set out on the long path of renewal. The Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment we formally announced today is a concrete manifestation of Gonzaga's ongoing commitment to leading and learning as we seek together to create a more just, equitable, and integral world for all. Today, you will hear from Gonzaga's provost, Dr. Dina Gonzalez, church leaders, including Father General Arturos Sosa, climate activists Bill McKibben and Kea Chatterjee, and Washington State Governor Jay Inslee, who each play a vital role in taking on this collective issue. I am grateful for their time and commitment to this work, and I am delighted to welcome them and all of you to Gonzaga University. Our institution is building on our strengths in academics and instruction to help prepare people who can work on the challenges ahead, educating students and teachers alike about climate change to foster the creative, science, and ethics-centered community we need. Additionally, we aim to help businesses, municipalities, tribes, and policymakers develop concrete plans to help their organizations and communities understand, mitigate, and adapt to a changing climate. We are deeply grateful to those whose hard work and dedication have made this important step possible. Dedicated faculty, academic leadership, benefactors, trustees, and regents, and students who are increasingly calling not only for information, but action to have an impact on the planet they will inherit from us. Thank you for joining us today and in the months and years ahead. Welcome. I am Dr. Dina Gonzalez, Provost and Senior Vice President of Gonzaga University. Happy Earth Day 51, and thank you for joining us in celebration of the launch of the Gonzaga Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment. Over the last two decades, Gonzaga has greatly expanded the ways in which it demonstrates its commitment to ecological stewardship and sustainability. From incorporating care of the planet into our mission statement and creating new courses of study to developing a plan for climate neutrality and hiring full-time sustainability staff, Gonzaga has dedicated considerable time and resources to giving life to its mission in graduating people who see and seek to resolve the ecological and social challenges facing our planet. Yet we know that the magnitude of global warming requires that we do more to prepare our students and our community to live and lead in an age of climate change. As you can imagine, this new interdisciplinary academic center has been years in the making. Linking together diverse scholars from engineering, education, business, and law to the sciences, environmental studies, philosophy, and much more, the Gonzaga Climate Center represents the next stage of our ongoing commitment to bringing the university's knowledge skills, and resources to help our students and our region learn how to face the challenge of a changing climate with wisdom, courage, and hope. Academic centers such as this have a special role to play within the university and within our community. By encouraging research, scholarship, creativity, they foster new opportunities, student-faculty research opportunities that provide complementarity to the classroom and community-engaged learning. As a university, the serious study and engagement on the intersection of climate, society, and the environment is critical to a modern 21st century curriculum. In supporting faculty engagement on these topics with colloquia, guest speakers, webinars, and workshops to help faculty in the classroom, 
this academic center will play an important role in our institutional and hopefully regional conversation about the challenge of climate change. I am delighted that Professor Brian Henning will serve as the inaugural director of the Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment. Dr. Henning is a professor of philosophy and of environmental studies. Dr. Henning, along with the Climate Center's Faculty Advisory Board, an interdisciplinary group of faculty from across campus, will work to carry out the mission of the Climate Center to provide resources and opportunities to meet the unprecedented challenges facing humanity and the wider natural environment in the 21st century. I am excited to work with faculty colleagues throughout the university in helping realize the mission of this important new center and to provide exemplary educational opportunities for our students. Thank you for joining us on this happy occasion. And again, happy Earth Day. The truth is that we're in a really critical moment in our planet's history. All of the hottest years on record have all occurred since 2005. Last year, 2020, was yet again the warmest year on record. And we become numb to it after a while. We're seeing sea level rises, and that leads to more and more climate refugees, people who are displaced because of that and um, basically have to migrate somewhere else. And that'll obviously have many different consequences, socially, economically, politically. If we keep at our current emissions trajectory, we're likely to have three to four degrees warming Celsius this century. To put that in perspective, the scientists of the world think that we can withstand up, up to two degrees. What's the truth about climate change? I think it's bad. It's not too late to curb a runaway global warming scenario. It's not. But it is dire, and we have to act now. The Gonzaga Center for Climate Society and the Environment is dedicated to bringing our academic mission to bear on the challenge of, of global climate change, bringing resources and capacity building to the Inland Northwest, uh, both on campus and in, in our region. All of the dialogue and the debate over the years helped clarify you know, the ways in which a center such as this is central to a student in a Jesuit environment, uh, to their education, to their program of study. It really does, I think, set up a caring attitude, but also knowledge that is scientific and, and culturally specific. So I think in those ways, it can really make a huge impact. Gonzaga has a really strong, clear mission identity. The heart of that, as, a, as an institution of higher education, of course, is, is helping to educate students to live and lead in the world that we, that we find ourselves. It matters what we're doing in our classrooms. What are we doing with our students? What are, they, what, are, what are they learning? And then who are those students becoming? What are they doing in their communities as they, they graduate? And so it's, it's just critically urgent that we um, use that academic mission to be of service to addressing uh, the challenge of climate change. We want to have students and teachers get the best knowledge that they can. And climate change is a multifaceted program, right? There's aspects of it that require science to understand, and then there's aspects of it that require our ethics and our personal philosophies and value systems to also tackle that issue. Through my work with Dr. Brian Henning and you know now the Climate Center, we have a collection of lessons plans now that tie in a lot to especially local climate issues here in the inland Pacific Northwest. When you're a kid, you get taught that there's not really anything you can do, you know, that other people make your decisions for you, that, you know, what are you one kid going to do and against this huge crisis that seems so scary and so daunting, so sometimes it's easier just to not think about it at all. But I never think that it's lack of passion in young people. I think that it's lack of knowledge. I think that 
in order to have that passion, it has to be run by some sort of emotion. And so it takes things like the Gonzaga Center to teach teachers how to teach their students about this. Because I think that as soon as you know the effects and you know what our future is going to look like without this change, then you can't not have that passion. One of the ways that we are supporting teachers and students in instruction is by being really intentional with providing professional development to all of our instructors, but really targeting science teachers to begin with. And that's been part of our partnership with Gonzaga. Gonzaga and the ESD have reached out and really provided robust opportunities for our teachers to continue to grow their own understanding as well as to develop lessons and opportunities that filter down to our students. And that's something we're really proud of. I'm really excited for the center to just become kind of a leader within Spokane um, on this issue and give all these great opportunities to students uh, to learn more, to um, you know, organize together within Spokane. Why is now the right time for the new Gonzaga Center for Climate, Society, and Environment? Uh, because the problem is so urgent. We have a responsibility to respond as an institution using our, our, our expertise as faculty members and as teachers and scholars and the passion of our students to help, help the community, help Spokane, help the Inland Northwest. Uh, to begin to respond, to understand the problem and figure out how do we go about surviving and thriving in, in this, this century. Good afternoon. I send you warm greetings from the General Curia of the Society of Jesus in Rome, and I congratulate you in the launch of Gonzaga University Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment. We must change the way we live in our common home. We must change the way we organize our economies and our societies in the face of global warming and climate change challenges that affect all of us but most of all, the poor. I am deeply grateful for Gonzaga University's institutional embrace of this challenge through the creation of the Center for Climate, Society and the Environment, a place for innovative, interdisciplinary scholarship teaching, consulting and capacity building. The Center embodies very well what we Jesuits call our four universal apostolic preferences, orientations that Pope Francis has given to us for our life and mission over the coming decade. Jesuits want to collaborate with others in care for our common home, and that is the principal mission of the Center. Jesuits desire to work with the poor, and that means working with vulnerable communities that have been pushed aside by climate change, something your center promises to do well. Most important, by working with the young and the poor along the path of caring for creation, we hope to find the pathway to God. Speaking to Gonzaga University community brings to mind the saint for whom the university is named, Luigi Gonzaga. Gonzaga was a young man, a 23-year-old student at the Roman College of the Society of Jesus, when he died caring for victims of an epidemic. He was not held back by the political and economic influence of his family. He gave all that away, living a life full of compassion and courage, boldly confronting the challenges of his day. Young people today hear the same call. Gonzaga University continues to prepare young people like Luigi Gonzaga and people who are not so young to engage the complex challenges of our times. The Society of Jesus thanks Gonzaga University 
for developing the capacity to provide resources and opportunities for students, community members, and leaders in the Pacific Northwest. May God bless you all as you formally begin the work of this important center today. Go Sachs! Good afternoon. Best wishes and greetings from the ecology sector of the Vatican Dicastery for promoting integral human development. Congratulations to you on the launch of Gonzaga's Center for Climate, Society and the Environment. It has been five years since Pope Francis wrote Laudato Si on care for our common home. And since then, he has urged us to realize the vision of integral ecology and seek to put it into action. Gonzaga's new center is timely. You are responding to the cry of the earth. The scientific community tells us that the state of Earth's ecosystems is dire. You have also accepted Pope Francis' invitation to respond to the cry of the poor. It is the most vulnerable of our human family who suffer most. Third, we must respond to the cry of children who call on us to act now to save their future. As Pope Francis noted in October of 2020, we have a choice. The choice between what matters and what doesn't. The choice between continuing to ignore the suffering of the poorest and to abuse our common home, our planet, or engaging at every level to transform the way we act. We are delighted to hear that Gonzaga University recognizes this urgency and is responding by creating this new academic center. This climate center represents a concrete manifestation of Pope Francis' vision of integral ecology. So hearty congratulations to you all from the Vatican and it will be a joy and honor for us to walk with you on this journey. God bless. Good afternoon and happy Earth Day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today to celebrate the launch of the Gonzaga Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment. My name is Dr. Brian Henning, Professor of Philosophy and Environmental Studies and Founding Director of the New Gonzaga Climate Center. So it's my great honor to welcome our first panelist, Washington State Governor and fifth generation Washingtonian, Jay Inslee. So from what I understand, Governor, uh, you played a major role in helping Washington State pass one of the most ambitious climate legislation in the nation, um, including the Clean Energy Transformation Act, which will require that all of our electricity in Washington State be 80% clean by 2030 and 100% clean by 2045. Now that our electricity is being decarbonized, what do we need to do next to reduce our emissions? Well, uh... First off, let me say that um, we haven't finished the first step yet, right? So this is a requirement, but there's a lot of work to do to make sure it gets fulfilled. And it's important to say that because we can't just create uh, goals and not have the implement, implementing legislation to make sure that it gets done. So to make sure the first thing gets done, we've got to advance uh, battery technology. We've got to do grid improvements. We've got to increase efficiency. Uh, we've got to uh, be fair to consumers so that we drive investment to renewable energy. What I'm saying is we can't consider the first box as checked, <laughs> so to speak. But we obviously need to look at the other sources of pollution other than our electrical grid. Uh, that is first transportation where we have the largest gap in our portfolio of actions. That's why I've talked about the clean fuel standard, which is 40% of our emissions portfolio. Now that's our largest sort of missing piece of the puzzle in the state of Washington. The clean fuel standard is one of the policies to deal with that, but we're also trying to pass an additional new transportation package, which will again uh, up our percentage of investment to green low and zero carbon uh, uh, modalities of transportation. So that's an extremely important part of our effort against uh, toxicity from uh, pollution. 
uh, we've got to continue to find a way to have our electrical charging station infrastructure in place. We've made big investments on that. We need to continue. Then in the built environment, uh, I've told you we now have the best energy efficiency code in the United States, but there's some things we can do to help get a financing capability of businesses and residents to actually be able to finance some of those retrogrades uh, to get that job done and make sure that the implementing regulatory structure is in place. So that's just some of the things we need to do. And I, I won't forget by mentioning continuing research and development. Hi, Governor Inslee. My name is Marissa Montessi and I'm a senior here at Gonzaga. I'm studying communications and environmental studies and I am the co-president of Fossil Free Gonzaga. Our second panelist today is Kea Chatterjee, executive director of US Climate Action Network and author of the book, The Zero Footprint Baby, How to Save the Planet While Raising a Healthy Baby. Her work focuses on building an inclusive movement in support of climate action. We are so happy to have you here with us today. Ms. Chatterjee, as the executive dress, director of the U.S. branch of the Climate Action Network, which includes over 1,300 non-governmental organizations working in more than 130 countries around the world, you are truly at the front lines of the international fight for climate action. How did you become involved in climate organizing? I actually got involved on a very discreet day and even a discreet minute of a discreet day. I was working at NASA headquarters here in DC uh, where, I, where I live right now. Uh, and uh, I was just chatting with one of my colleagues, uh, Waleed, and uh, talking about how our weekend was. And he at the time was the cryospheric scientist uh, uh, program manager at NASA. So he studied ice. And we were just chatting and at some point in the conversation, he's like, oh my gosh, look at this data that just came in from Goddard Space Flight Center. And I and we kind of looked over and I, we were looking at the screen together and we were both like, this is just obviously wrong. Uh, and we called on speakerphone over and we were like, uh, did you guys even check this data before sending it? And they said, actually, we checked it over and over and over again. And that's how much sea ice there is. Uh, but my reaction even then was one of total shock because I, you know, I had just recently come out of grad school and really had been had been taught about the the pace at which change would happen in a way that didn't make me think it would be so immediate and in my face. And, and obviously it's not that I was having like an emotional reaction to ice. For me, it was that having, you know, having studied ecology and ecosystems, it was it was looking at it and thinking of how many people wouldn't have food and how many people wouldn't have water and how many people would lose shelter and how many people, you know, like like the, the amount, the vast amount of human suffering and the difficulty in conveying that to people um, because of the complexity of the system was what hit me. And so I went to my boss, uh, Jack Kay, who still runs the research program uh, in, in earth sciences at NASA. And I just said, I need to, I need to work on climate change now. Uh, and I have ever since. Our third guest this afternoon is Bill McKibben, a world renowned author, environmentalist and activist. In 1988, he wrote The End of Nature, uh, what is seen as the very first book for a common audience about global warming. And he's, of course, the co-founder and senior advisor at 350.org, an international climate campaign that works in 188 countries around the world. Professor McKibben, it's been more than 30 years since you wrote The End of Nature. How would you describe the intervening period? Do you think that we're doing enough to address global warming? Look, 30 years ago, this was an abstract problem. But as Keo points out, at a certain point along the way, it became very real. We were offering a warning 30 years ago about what would happen if we didn't do anything. And then, thanks to the big campaign of deception and denial and disinformation by the oil industry, we didn't do anything. And so all the things that scientists said would happen are happening. And they're happening very fast. And we're nowhere near yet rising to the occasion. We're not doing anything like what's demanded. Uh, this is not one more political problem on a list of political problems. This is the existential risk that human civilization has ever faced. And at the moment, it's a test that we're failing. Governor Inslee, the intersection of race, class, and pollution is well documented. The color of your skin and the number of zeros in your paycheck is a very significant determinant of the level of pollution in the, your air and water. 
What are two or three of the most immediate steps that we can take to demonstrate and grow our commitment to dismantling environmental racism and more fairly distributing environmental benefits and burdens? Well, several things, but the first thing is to reduce pollution. Look, fundamentally reducing pollution is an anti-racist approach. And as a result, I mean, I, I was sort of got this from a personal standpoint. I met a young Latina, she was about 14 years of age and she did her in the, in the Duwamish neighborhood in the industrial area of Seattle. And she went out and evaluated the, the occurrence of asthma in the relationship to the freeways down in the Duwamish area and, and some of the industrial sites. And she found this enormous correlation. Every quarter mile you got closer to that freeway, her, co her colleagues had huge increase in their asthma rates. It was incredible how linear was this relationship. And, 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 and she said the reason she did this, she said, you know, I was 11 years old because I, until I found out that there were some kids who didn't have asthma. All her friends had asthma. And her findings have subsequently been confirmed by the epidemiologists at the University of Washington. So the first thing I would say is reduce pollution. That's the most anti-racist thing we can do in the environmental movement. But the second thing is why we build these policies to make sure that we drive investments in these, uh, 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 in these BIPOC communities, in these communities of poverty that are breathing this soot. So for instance, in our cap and invest, uh, invest bill, we drive investments to these disproportionately impacted communities. We make sure that when we make investment decisions, we're driving them to these communities that need the jobs and need better health results. And I'm very proud of the bill that we now are working on is the, the, the best environmental justice bill, uh, certainly in the country and maybe in the world along these lines. We also have maintain a regulatory approach to make sure that nothing that we do to reduce uh, carbon ends up concentrating pollution in a certain neighborhood. We gotta prevent that. So we have provisions that to prevent the concentration of uh, toxic producing economic activity. So number one, reduce pollution. Number two, make sure in the process of doing that, you don't exacerbate that situation. In fact, you make it better by creating jobs in these communities. I'm I know we're capable of doing both. Ms. Chatterjee, as you know, climate change disproportionately impacts indigenous people, underserved communities, and people of color. How do we begin to move forward in pursuing climate action during a pandemic that has highlighted the vast social, social, economic, and health inequalities in our country and around the world? I think that on the bright side of this is that we have an opportunity right now to reimagine what normal is. We've been kind of pulled off of our normal co course of action, and that's a moment that we can really imagine something different. And I think that the things that we need to do right now are, are the same in order to deal with the climate crisis as they are in order to deal with the underlying racial injustice crisis if we choose to, to solutions that address both at once. And so we have a pretty broad consensus right now that we need to have massive investments um, that we need to pass really strong standards that are high, high bar climate standards, but also labor standards, also racial justice standards, and that we and that we need to to have an eye on justice in all of the work we're doing. And I and and right now, a lot of the emphasis in the community is in making sure that 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 happens. Um, and that means that we need to really invest in things that people need in this country. And we need to, we need to invest in public transportation. We've seen all around the country that buses have continued to be used by essential workers, predominantly by people of color, predominantly by women. And yet in most places, our bus system is barely, it doesn't even deserve the term system. You know, people are waiting 20, 30 minutes to get on a bus. Uh, and then, you know, it's not like there are bus lanes or rapid transit, you know, the, the, these are atrocious systems. You can go sector by sector and just show how we are failing people right now, even before COVID. And there's no reason now when we need an investment in our economy, not to make an investment where we fix these things. And we fix these things in a way that address racial injustice. And we fix these things in a way that get us off of the, of the, 
of the economy we were on, where, where it was based in digging things up, burning them, sacrificing communities that, that, that uh, we de deemed sacrificable as a society, and, 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 and moving to a society where we say, no, all of these people are essential, and we've got to take care of each other, which means we have to invest in mobility that doesn't create pollution. We have to invest in regenerative agriculture. We have to invest in renewable electricity and making those investments at the same time that we don't at all back away from stopping the dirty stuff that it that has that has disproportionately impacted the health of black and brown and indigenous people in this country and creating this enormous health and wealth gap um, in this country. And so we have to do both of these things at the same time. And I actually think that this moment we're in creates an opportunity to do that because we're in a moment where we have to reimagine society. We have no other choice right now. Uh, and so I have great hope that we will reimagine it in a way that, that allows us all to thrive. Thank you for eloquence as a Jesuit institution with a strong, clear social justice mission that really speaks uh, to what, what Gonzaga is about. So moving on to Professor McKibben, Pope Francis often says that we need to learn to hear both the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth. How do you conceive of the relationship between the plight of the poor and the state of the earth? Marissa, just the right question. Um, look, the iron law of climate change is, the less you did to cause it, the sooner and the harder you get hit by it. And that's been true from the beginning. We learned earlier this year from vast epidemiological study that forget climate change, there are 8.7 million people a year dying from the direct effects of breathing fossil fuel combustion. That's more than malaria, HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis combined. It's one death in five in this country. And you know, two guesses who's dying, who gets to breathe this stuff. Um, you know, one way of thinking about it maybe is that the most important thing anyone said last year in 2020, a dark, difficult year, was what George Floyd said as he was being murdered. I, I can't breathe. And you can't breathe because there's a racist cop kneeling on your neck. And as people pointed out, you can't breathe because there's a coal-fired power plant down the street and it's always the same street. And you can't breathe because there's toxic pollution. And I mean, this is time for this to end. And I think that that's what Pope Francis was talking about, uh, that these questions, you know, people used to try to say that somehow um, um, you couldn't solve uh, the question of poverty without, you know, having lots and lots of burning lots and lots of fossil fuel. Well, it's just the opposite. The more of that we burn, the deeper we go into this kind of uh, ecological debt that has the poorest people on the planet as its first victims. Governor Inslee, in 2019, you attended the Spokane climate strike, which was led by hundreds of students from local schools and universities. In fact, you named my teenage daughter, Hope Henning, who led that climate strike, inspirational Washingtonian of the day. What would you say to young people who feel like their elders who are in positions of power are not doing enough to address the climate crisis? Well, they need to tell their elders, uh, lead, follow, or get out of the way, that's it. And so we need the leadership from young people. The first thing I would say is the single most powerful thing I would say is, please vote. This is the most uh, scientifically literate generation. It's the most compassionate, socially responsible generation. We need it to lead by voting. And when you vote, go get your friend to vote, your cousin to vote, your neighbor to vote. This is pivotal. And the reason is, is that young people get this. You know, vast, vast majorities of younger generations understand the critical nature of climate change. They vote on climate change. And as those numbers increase, so does our ability to move uh, the kind of policies that I've talked about that are absolutely necessary. That's the single most important thing I would say. Second, I would say, uh, I hope you'll find a way in your professional life to somehow involve yourself in this mission. Because no matter what you do, it's in business or law or the clergy or medicine, whatever you do, you will be in a leadership position to take action on climate change, on looking at your inventory and your supply chain, looking at your transportation policies and your own business. Uh, you know, how you educate your students when you're a teacher, 
find a way in your professional endeavors to be a leader of this. You don't have to be governor or president to be a leader on this. These are two things. And third, don't uh, give, give in um, or give up to the virtue of youth, which is impatience and be demanding of folks um, you know, of a little older time that have a pace that might be a little slower. We need the impatience of youth. It demands it. We do not have much time in this effort. So vote, find a way to professionally make this happen and, uh, and put pedal to the metal. Things are gonna do pretty well. And I've seen Marissa there. And when I see young leaders like this, it gives me hope in a time that sometimes uh, we need hope. So Miss Chatterjee, going off of that, what would you say to young people such as myself who feel overwhelmed by the magnitude of climate change? There's a fair amount of research that's been done uh, around particularly young people and, uh, and depression and overwhelm related to climate change. And from what I've read, the very best thing that you can do is be engaged and involved and feel like you have some agency over the situation. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to be the one up there with a megaphone. I enjoy getting up there with a megaphone. That doesn't have to be you. You can make some beautiful signs if you're an artist. You can help uh, organize the database if you're a data person. You, I mean, there's so many different roles that people can play. Um, but the very best way not to feel overwhelmed is to, is to join together with a group of people who are doing something about it. And there are a lot of lenses through which you can do that. Um, you know, there's not just the clubs on campus, there's stuff in the community, there, there's obviously, you know, through, through a faith lens, there are ways to plug in, through a youth lens, there are ways to plug in, there, through, through any lens you can think of, there is a way to engage uh, on the climate crisis, and there is no better way um, to, 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 to stop it from keeping you up at night. Because when you're together doing things with other people, it makes it fun. Um, and, and we are just social beings as humans. And, and we just do so much better when we band together with other people for a cause. Mr. McKibben, this question is, might think of as coming from adults who are 40 and over, uh, who want to accompany youth in this movement and be effective at helping them. Adults tend to be the ones with money and connections, but oftentimes, uh, either they're not connected to youth or they don't know how to help facilitate the work that young people are, are trying to do. So you've done this work for, for quite a long time now. Um, and, and I was just curious what you would say, if you have any words of wisdom for the adults out there that want to be some you know, intergenerational helpers. Well, there's no shortage of opportunities, um, Brian, for people to get engaged at this point. And uh, you know, we've been naming group after group. Everybody's got, you know, 350 Spokane being a perfect example, just of all kinds of adults and youth together figuring out how to bring what they've got to bring. Uh, I'll say one thing, and this is Gonzaga specific. Um, one thing that older people bring is memory uh, of what the world was like uh, before these changes began. And I think that's really important. And you correct me if I'm wrong, but I'd say it's possible that Gonzaga's most famous graduate ever was Bing Crosby. And, you know, Bing Crosby's greatest hit of all time, uh, White Christmas, was set here, the movie of the same name in which he starred was set here in Vermont, where I live. And it's about a day when we could reliably count on winter as a season filled with cold and snow. Um, we can't reliably quite count on that anymore. And one of the things that older people can do is reflect back on the beauty of the world that they were given and try and communicate what that world was like and how precious the parts of it that remain still are and really dedicate themselves to helping to helping make sure that as much as possible of the world that we were born into survives for the people that we care about the most, our kids and our grandkids and all who will come after them. So, uh, you know, um, uh, there've been a lot of graduates uh, since then, but it does seem worth, uh, 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 a slight homage to Mr. Crosby and a great song and a great vision 
uh, of the world as once it was. That was a really wonderful way of connecting to two different threads. Just um, starting with, with you, Kea, uh, what would you say your hopes are for the Gonzaga Center for Climate Society and the Environment? I hope that it is the place where people come come in and learn enough that they're inspired to continue to engage uh, in 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 the course of their of their lifetimes, and I have no doubt that it will be the it will it will be that. Uh, as you all know, we had a U.S. Climate Action Network meeting uh, where where you hosted us, uh, and thank you for that. Uh, and it's a you know it what strikes me about the the location is is just how uh, in nature the area is and how much is at stake for people uh, who, who, are, who are living in places where, where there are effects of fires, where there are effects of flooding. Um, and it's really just so evident. And so, so I feel like it's, it's the right place and the right time uh, and an incredible opportunity to bring a generation of students uh, into leadership. What are, your, what are your hopes for the Gonzaga Climate Center? Well, I would just, uh, what Kea said is absolutely right, but I, and I would just say, it's um, sometimes easier to do this work in Northern California or New York City or Vermont or someplace like that. Uh, places like Eastern Washington are absolutely crucial uh, for, for people to get fully involved, fully engaged. Uh, we have to have leadership from every corner of the country. And um, there's no more important institution in that part of the world than Gonzaga. And so you guys are well positioned not only to help a generation after generation of students learn what's up, but to help your neighbors and everyone around focus on what's essential going forward. Governor Inslee, what was your reaction when you heard that Gonzaga was creating a Center for Climate Society and the Environment? Well, um, uh, my reaction is um, just about the same when Corey Kispert hits a three-pointer from about 28 feet to win a game. But we're thrilled by the Gonzaga team and what has happened in that community. It has been so uplifting to the whole state, certainly the Spokane area, to create this incredible community in basketball. We have the same spirit in our effort against climate change, which is that we, we persevere We've had now two decades of success in Gonzaga basketball. We gotta have at least another two decades of success against climate change. And we need to be just as good and just as world-class. And I look at that way. This is a very noble mission we're on. I mean, humans have been involved in noble missions for a long time for you know, women's suffrage, the civil rights. And this is another noble mission. Everything else depends on it. And it, it's a very selfless mission because it, it's something that will help the seventh generation. So I guess my reaction when I heard Gonzaga wanted to play a leadership role was I was just thrilled. And it's important, frankly, in Eastern Washington to have leadership of this, uh, of this dimension. It's important to have leadership everywhere in our state. So I'm just thrilled. And Marissa, when I see young leadership like yourself, again, it is inspiring to me. It, it makes me feel uh, that we're gonna get this job done. I'm so grateful to everyone who has joined us here today. Your interest and support means a great deal to us as we move forward together at this crucial time. This panel of esteemed guests has reminded us of what is at stake for humanity and for the trajectory of all life on our common home. The last third of the 20th century witnessed a fundamental shift in Earth-human relations. The human species now threatens Earth's capacity to sustain life as we know it. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, the most comprehensive ever undertaken, stated that, quote, human activity is putting such a strain on the natural functions of the Earth that the ability of the planet's ecosystems to sustain future generations can no longer be taken for granted. Global warming is accelerating, causing rising coastlines, larger, more erratic storms, and longer, more devastating wildfires. The poorest, most vulnerable people in our human family have the fewest resources with which to respond, yet they will be the ones most severely impacted. Pope Francis has rightly called this what it is, a climate emergency. In his words, quote, future generations stand to inherit a greatly spoiled world. Our children and grandchildren should not have to pay the cost of our generation's irresponsibility. Indeed, Pope Francis continues, 
As is becoming increasingly clear, young people are calling for a change. At this pivotal moment in our species history, our universities and colleges have a vital role to play in helping to understand and respond to the crisis. Today, all fields of human inquiry are called upon to collaborate in what the eminent cultural historian Thomas Berry called the great work of our era, to transition from a period of human devastation of the earth to a period of integral human earth relations. As part of a Jesuit Catholic humanistic institution of higher learning, the Gonzaga Climate Center is a central expression of our mission to foster, quote, global engagement, solidarity with the poor and vulnerable, and care for the planet. The social and ecological challenges confronting us today require that we direct the scholarly and teaching expertise of our faculty and the passion and vision of our students to be of even greater service to our inland Northwest community. Through this new center, Gonzaga seeks to be a regional leader in at least three ways. First, by educating students to live and lead in an era of climate disruption. Second, by training teachers and faculty at every level to thoughtfully incorporate climate literacy and integral ecology into their classrooms. And third, by promoting innovative interdisciplinary scholarship, teaching, consulting, and capacity building at the intersection of climate, society, and the environment. And this work is already well underway. This academic year, through the Center's Climate Literacy Project, and in partnership with Spokane Public Schools and our Educational Service District, we have already worked with over 100 secondary science teachers, helping them explore ways to motivate their students to better understand and respond to the climate crisis. It is my honor to serve as the founding director of the Gonzaga Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment. On behalf of the center, I want to thank the many generous and talented staff colleagues, most especially Mary Joan Hahn and Erica Whitaker, who made this wonderful launch event possible. We would also extend our sincere thanks to our partners at the New Priorities Foundation for their generous support of the center's work. Finally, on behalf of the many Gonzaga faculty engaged in this work, I thank President McCullough, Provost Gonzalez, and Vice Provost Weber and the many academic deans who, even amidst a pandemic, had the vision and courage to help realize this new academic initiative. To successfully confront the climate crisis, we all must come together to realize a future in which all forms of life can flourish. Visit gonzaga.edu slash climate center for information about the center and how you can stay involved. Again, that is gonzaga.edu slash climate center. There you'll find information about upcoming events, educational opportunities, and if you have the means, consider a donation to support our work. Together, we can provide resources and opportunities to students, faculty, and community members across the Inland Northwest. Join us as we seek to learn and lead in this difficult age of climate change. Thank you and happy Earth Day. With today's need for environmental equity, it is high time we turn the corner and begin taking progressive strides towards positive change. As an alum, I am immensely inspired to see Gonzaga University at the forefront of this effort, providing its students and faculty, the local community, and the world at large with invaluable resources and an outlet for the positive change we so desperately need. I cannot wait to see the remarkable advances that Gonzaga Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment fosters. From a proud alum, go Zags. Hi, I'm Spokane City Council President Brian Beggs, and I'm so excited for the launch of the Gonzaga Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment. When I was growing up in the 1970s, it was all about voluntary actions. But we know now, just like a voluntary fire code doesn't work, a climate code doesn't work unless it applies to everybody. If we want to thrive, we need to know the rules for evidence-based practices that will support people, businesses, the environment, so that we can thrive on this planet. And that's what this center is going to provide us, the guidance to go far into the future together. Thanks and congratulations. Hi, I'm Maggie Jones, class of 2016. As a proud Zag alum, I am delighted about GU's Climate Center because a building really represents a symbol of foundation for creating this culture of innovative and interdisciplinary scholarship for the care of the planet. Hello everyone, I'd like to congratulate Gonzaga University on the creation of its Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment. 
As we all work to address the very real and current threat of the climate crisis, we must take action now to ensure that current and future generations are not forced to deal with the consequences of inaction. But any action we take cannot replicate the same mistakes of the past. We need to take an inclusive and empowering approach to ensure communities of color are not left behind. And that means developing data and science-driven policies that prioritize climate and environmental justice to promote public health and economic opportunity for all Americans. So I'm proud of the discussions here today and the proactive measures you are taking to combat climate change and lead Eastern Washington to a cleaner and greener future. Hi, my name is Jill and I'm a class of 2021 environmental studies major. I'm so excited for Gonzaga to launch the new Center for Climate Society and the Environment because this is a great opportunity for people of all majors and backgrounds at Gonzaga to have a common ground to learn and take action. Moving these conversations to a wider scope outside of courses that are usually about the environment is so important for making change. Hi, I'm State Senator Andy Billig, and I'm so excited to congratulate Gonzaga University on the launch of their new Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment. Spokane is already a leader for our state in so many ways, so I'm not surprised to see Gonzaga stepping up to lead in this area of critical importance. We must have the resources available in our community to help business and education and civic leaders to better understand and respond to the challenges of climate change. This center will help ensure the preservation of the incredible natural beauty of our region and the health and survival of our planet for generations to come. Thanks and go Zags. The establishment of the Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment at Gonzaga University is encouraging and exciting. With Pope Francis' encyclical Laudato Si, and with the increased awareness of the need for stewardship of the environment, this project will provide formation and education to strengthen our caring and action. Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be able to join you and celebrate Gonzaga Center for Climate, Society, and Environment. Congratulations to Dr. Brian Henning and everyone who's worked so hard to make this pioneering center a reality. Investing in good climate science is absolutely critical to addressing the climate crisis in our nation. We need the best and brightest minds focusing on these important challenges. And we need to be using the most holistic, cross-disciplinary solutions to look at these problems. That is why we know that climate needs to be addressed and that Gonzaga is a good place to addressing it. The impacts on every single person, the impacts on the community, and the impacts on the ecosystem. From wildfires, to sea level rises, to ocean acidification, Washingtonians are already starting to feel the impacts. But we've also seen how addressing climate can be a great opportunity. A chance to rebuild our nation's infrastructure, providing millions of jobs, a chance to install cleaner and more affordable sources of energy, a chance to rebalance how we use our nation's public lands and the CLT efforts that are going on in Spokane itself. So I'm so proud of Gonzaga for stepping up as a leader on this important issue and for educating the leaders of tomorrow about how we solve these problems. The new center will provide a platform for education, activism, and adaptation. It will provide for Gonzaga students the opportunity for them to lead on these important climate challenges. Thank you very much for allowing me to be part of this. I certainly hope that Gonzaga continues in the great leadership to solve our nation's problems. Thank you.